It's a pleasure to introduce my good friend now. Uh, he's easy to become a friend to. But His Excellency, uh, I don't give you a year. Anyway, he was born. <laughs> he, has, he and his wife have two children. Um, he's got a, his back, uh, baccalaureate degree was in mathematics. And then he went into business in his degree in, in Paris, France. And then he graduated from the School of Commercial uh, Commerce and Business Administration in France. And then he started to go in a new work area, civil service, desk officer for Europe, uh, deputy director. Now watch the developing of this ambassador. You'll find out he wasn't an ambassador just once now. He has done what everyone in here would like to do one item of in their lifetime. He's done it more than one lifetime. So anyway, I'm impressed. <laughs> he was uh, uh, Director of Fishery, Ministry of Fishery, Secretary General, the Ministry of Foreign Trade. And then the king decided he needed to just have a little more challenge ambassador of His Majesty to the European Union, Belgium and Luxembourg, Secretary General of uh, Foreign Affairs and Cooperation, then Ambassador of His Majesty to Germany, and then we're honored to have him as Ambassador to the United States of America. Marhaba. Uh, he's found uh, uh, his thing activities done. He founded uh, founding member of the Re Rebot Alfath Association, a pilot, a founding member of the International Wildlife Film and Environmental Festiv Festiv uh, Festiv uh, Festival. He's officer uh, of the Wissom. And then we only have one other person in this room, Dr. Peterson, that shares this. He's a knight, <laughs> duly authorized by the King of Morocco. <laughs> uh, so we have two knights protecting us, so we're no problem. Security, don't need you. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, Commander of the Order, uh, Leopold. Uh, awarded the insignia of officer of the Legion, the Honor of France, uh, award of the Grand Cross of the Federal Republic of Germany by the President of Germany. He's fluent in Arabic, English, and French. Hey, listen to what the ambassador says. I mean, he's the person that really is there, whether it's been in Europe or Morocco. And also, please ask questions. He has answers, and he's happy to help you. Now my honor to have the ambassador. Thank you. He, he has been saying too much, you know. <laughs> this, is, this is too much. Uh, just I would like to, to thank the university for inviting me and the Kennedy Center for International Studies for its support and uh, my friend Keith Martin, who has been handling this, this visit, so thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's very difficult for a diplomat to talk about an audience uh, because diplomats usually do not talk. They work behind curtains. It's a wonderful job. We can do a lot of things, but usually we don't talk. And as I heard that this is broadcast and then everyone is following this and it's not an easy topic, so there might be some gaps that we can fill in, in uh, conversation together. But I will, I will try really to, to give you an idea of, of this, of what's happening. Uh, I know that we don't have a lot of time because we have to stop 10 to, to 3. And uh, I don't know, I hope we'll have time for questions. But I will, be, I will try to be very fast. Before I start, I just wanted to tell you something about the history of Morocco and the United States. And many know, know this. but. In uh, uh, December 1977, 
Sultan Sidi Mohammed bin Abdullah, at that time we used to say Sultan instead of King, decreed a statement to promote trade and commerce with the new Republic of the United States. This act was the first public recognition of the United States by a head of state. And we are very proud that uh, Morocco has been the first country to recognize the United States of America. And in 1786, Thomas Barclay, who was a diplomat from Philadelphia, was appointed to negotiate a treaty of peace and friendship that was signed in uh, 1786, negotiated in 1833-1967, and it is the longest unbroken treaty of the, of the United States history. It has been signed by John Adams, the second president of the United States, and by Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States. So just a small introduction to say that uh, we have been friends for a very, very long time and still then. Let's come back to what we call the Arab Spring or the uh, Arab uprising or the Arab revolutions. I mean, so many uh, words to qualify it. And when, when you follow what's happening in the news or you read the newspapers, and sometimes you're confused because we put all countries together. It's true that it took everybody by surprise. It took governments by surprise. It took politicians, experts, analysts, uh, media by surprise. No one announced anything about what happened in uh, this, this region. And then it went very fast. It started with uh, Tunisia and this young vendor who uh, uh, immolated himself in, 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 uh, in the street. It was in, in December. And after that, you know, there were riots and there were demonstrations in, in Tunisia that led to the departure of uh, um, Ben Ali uh, f to, to Saudi Arabia and uh, his resignation. Uh, and all countries followed. Almost 18 Arab countries noticed or witnessed this kind of demonstrations. Or, uh, some, some have been very dramatic in Egyptian, in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen. Most of them led to the departure of the, uh, in Tunisia, in, in Libya, uh, in, in Yemen. Let's see first what is common with all these countries. They all have an extremely young population, half are under 25. A high unemployment rate, including among young uh, graduates, strong social disparities, a feeling of injustice and ex exclusion, problems of governance, transparency, and uh, corruption. And they all have the same symptoms, but it didn't lead to, lead to the same uh, conclusions or the same situations. And I, I, we can come back maybe during questions about what happened in, in, in some of the countries. It will take us too much time. But I would like just to uh, talk about the case of Morocco and why some people find it's very different from others and why it, it went uh, this way. First, you have to understand about Morocco that the political choices of Morocco from the beginning, from the independence, have never been the one party regime. We always have parties. Sometimes they had difficulties, the Socialist Party or the Communist Party, but we always had uh, multi-partisan. Uh, uh, it was something in our uh, uh, political life. Then Morocco is a kingdom since 1791. Uh, I think this is a stability that you don't find in many other uh, countries. The second or the third thing is that in many countries, these the president have been staying in power such a long time. Uh, 41 years for Gaddafi in Libya, 23 years for Ben Ali in Tunisia, 30 years for Mubarak in uh, Egypt, and he was vice president since 1975. Assad succeeded to, succeeded to his father, who was in power for three decades, and and, and so. In Morocco in 1999, 
King Muhammad VI accede to the throne. He was 36 years old and very close to the population. And, and, and uh, uh, you, you, I don't know, in French we say en phase avec sa, la, la population. And, and this is very important that you have a king that was young and was talking to his people and visiting the country uh, everywhere. Since, since now, the king is in every village, in every region of Morocco, going and seeing projects and, and visiting the, uh, the country. But it started in 19, if you remember for those and you, you are students in uh, political science, a big move uh, was in Morocco in 1990. Uh, eight, uh, when the uh, country noticed or experienced what we call the uh, gouvernement d'alternance, d'alternance, when uh, all those uh, political leaders who were outside the country and came back with the king's pardon, and we had elections in 1997, the Socialist Party won the elections, and then the king called Mr. Yusufi. Uh, who was the leader of the Socialist Party, and he became the uh, Prime Minister until September 2002. And this was a big move that opposition uh, started to become part of uh, ruling things and, and uh, uh, deciding things in, in the government. Then the king started huge reforms immediately after he acceded to the throne. The first one was uh, what we call the family code. It's simple, it was just giving same rights to men and, uh, and the women. Uh, in his first speech in, 19, in August 1999, he became king the 23rd of July 1999. In August, the king said that we cannot speak of progress and development of a society while women who constitute half of the population are denied their rights. The uh, family code means the law in matters of marriage, dissolution of marriage, filiation, will, succession, etc. Mandatory inclusion of women in national and local elections, the beginnings of the process of regionalization to bring power and decision making closer to local communities, uh, human rights issue, if you heard about what we call the Equity and Reconciliation Commission that was settled in 2004, and it was just to, from the king said, I want to know since the day I became, since the day of the independence to the day I became king, if there were any uh, violations of human rights and what we can do to fix that, that this will never happen again. And this was something very, very big and very moving in Morocco. I remember that because this commission was composed of 16 people. M many of them have been in jail for uh, their political positions and suffered from human rights violations. They were the ones who were dealing with the case. And uh, it was handled this way. This commission said anyone who thinks he suffered from a human right violation has to send his file to the commission. And the commission received 20,046 cases. Uh, we are talking of 50 years. And then they had to go through all these cases and to see really what, what happened. Then they ended up with 16,800 cases that could be considered a human rights violation. Then they started to go case by case. And it was very moving because uh, I remember seeing uh, live testimonies on television of people coming and saying, this is what happened to me. I suffered from this. I suffered from that. And sometimes it was not easy you know, to come in front of television, in front of the media, live, and to describe what, uh, what happened. But this was a way to reconciliate Moroccans with their past. Let's see what happened, and let's see how we can fix it and repair. If something has been done to someone, we have to repair it, and then we have to do what we have to do so this will never happen again. And this is, was very important because this was involving everybody. It was involving the population, it was involving the media, it was involving diplomats, politicians, NGOs, all population. And this commission was meeting in many cities 
to listen to people and to tell what they were doing. So why I tell you all this is to then you can see how the population was participating in these big reforms and these big movements that took place, which was not maybe the case in many other uh, countries. Then we launched also something that we called the National Initiati Initiative for Human Development. This is just to uh, uh, reduce poverty, uh, precariousness, and social exclusion. sustain the effort to fight illiteracy, and uh, women were suffering more than men from illiteracy. Uh, and uh, let me quote the Washington Post, what he said about all these reforms. He said, Morocco has, over the past decade, undergone a slow but profound transformation from traditional monarchy to constitutional monarchy. We had a big demonstration on the 20th of February last year, and uh, it, it was called the 20 February movement, and the, all, all in, in many countries, I mean, the one is the 14 February movement, 20 February movement, but many things happened in, in that month of February in many uh, of, of these uh, um, countries. So immediately after that, in the 9th of March, the king, delivered a very, very important speech in which he announced a reform of the Constitution. And then, during three months, we had a lot of meetings involving trade unions, uh, NGOs, uh, political parties, everyone, uh, to see what reforms shall be introduced in the uh, Constitution. And uh, uh, the king, in his speech, went uh, uh, very far, and I think it was very important that he will continue uh, this trend of reforms and maybe speeding up uh, what uh, was, has been done. And uh, this new constitution, uh, first it gave uh, that the prime minister will be chosen by uh, among the party that will win the elections. And this is what happened after the uh, last elections. The Islamist party won the elections with 27% of the seats. And he was asked to form a government. So we have a government with a coalition of four parties. The Islamist party is leading the coalition, but three other parties came uh, to uh, build a majority. Uh, the Islamist party, contrary from many other countries, has been in, uh, is a political party that has been involved in the political life in Morocco for 16 years. They have been in parliament, they have been in the opposition, so they have been participating in the uh, political life, and it means that they have been able to, able to see and to learn how to work with, with other parties, how to make uh, uh, coalitions, how uh, to uh, present reforms, and so on. So I think this w helped a lot when they were asked to form a government because they won the elections and the prime minister it was not, it looks very difficult for him to build this uh, uh, coalition. Uh, the Constitution gave more powers to the Parliament in controlling the uh, uh, government. It empowers Moroccans with more control and leadership at the local government level, making local and regional officials directly accountable to voters establishes independent agencies to guarantee civil and human rights protection, and establishes an independent judiciary with a new mandated constitutional court. If you read even the preamble of the Constitution, Moroccans are defined as Arabic, Amazir, Hassani, Sub-Saharian, African, Andalusian, Jewish, and Mediterranean. So the components of the Moroccans is defined with all this because we have different cultures, different regions, and the Moroccans uh, are a mix of all these, these cultures. <coughs> so I think these this are the, the, what can explain how things have been 
different in Morocco compared to many other countries. This doesn't mean that we have overcome all our difficulties. Uh, fight, I mean, combating poverty, um, solving problems of education, all the things are very important and uh, the new government and, and all the political forces in Morocco are trying to overcome uh, these difficulties. And I think this is very uh, important. You can enter into details, you can follow what's, uh, what's happening in, in, in Morocco and uh, uh, you will see how things are building up and how uh, all the components of the political life and of the society are trying to uh, work uh, together. We talk, when we talk about the Arab countries, we talk about demonstrations as if it was the first time that it happened. I mean, since I, I was in the public life, I remember demonstrations in Morocco all the time or strikes in, so it's not something that is new. This, the demonstration on the 20th of February was, was a big one, but it was another demonstration among many others. Just to finish and maybe leave time, to questions because maybe you would like to ask some and we can then interact and, and discuss. Uh, we have signed a free trade agreement with the United States of America on 2004 and this agreement entered into force in 2006. This opens a big way for uh, economic and commercial relations between Morocco and the uh, United States. And I was telling my friends during the lunch that uh, uh, Utah is the one who for the moment be benefited the most because the commerce between Utah and Morocco have been multiplied by 20 from 20 2006 to now. It's not a huge amount, but, but it's, it's really progressing a, a, a lot. So this, these are the things that uh, I wanted to tell you. I insisted from the beginning of the long time uh, friendship, the oldest as I, as I told you, and the uh, values we share, basic values of decency, kindness, peace, and the belief on, in individual initiatives. Uh, we have been uh, great partners of the United States and still great partners of the United States and uh, we are trying in our region to do the best what is good for our region and uh, uh, the better relations among our uh, neighbors and in this belt in the south of the Mediterranean in the north of uh, Africa. So this is briefly just to hint and to open the appetite for you and for asking questions. You see, I've left 20 minutes for, for questions because I don't want just to be the only one to speak. So I would like also to listen to you. If you have remarks to make, if you have questions to ask, I will be very happy to answer in the uh, few minutes that we have uh, uh, left. Thank you. So, so we have a wireless mic here on the stand. We'd ask you to come down and, and form a queue. Please tell us your name and what you're studying, and then uh, you can ask your question. So it makes it a little bit scarier to walk down the aisle, uh, but feel free, uh, please, to form a queue. I think the earlier you come down, the better, because uh, at the end, everyone remembers their question. So please. Hi, um, my name is Katie May. I'm a Middle Eastern Studies and Arabic major. And um, I know that Morocco has headed the resolution in the UN and the Security Council against the Assad regime and that they're um, now participating in the Friends of Syria conference. Um, and I was curious if you could talk a little more about, if you could talk about um, what Morocco thinks is the best way to handle the situation in Syria and if it can be done without the help of China and, um, and Russia. I like lectures that start by easy questions. <laughs> uh, and I told you that there will be gaps, so pardon me. Uh, I mean, what's, what's happening in, in uh, uh, Syria? No one can accept that. 
it's really unacceptable. And it's painful to see that uh, the death toll increases every day, and it doesn't stop. Morocco has played its role in the Arab League and in the Security Council, because we are members in the Security Council for two years, starting the 1st of, uh, of January. So we have been uh, presenting with the other countries this uh, resolution to try to put an end to what's happening there. And you know the results, because you have been uh, following uh, this and uh, what happened in this resolution, even that uh, we accepted all amendments for those who didn't uh, uh, want this resolution. So a lot of discussions and uh, accepted uh, all amendment. And we thought that we maybe had found a document that would be accepted by the 15 members of the Security Council, but uh, uh, it was not the case, and the two countries vetoed the uh, document. Uh, the situation in Syria concerns the, all the Arab countries, and it concerns all the world, because uh, no one can accept what uh, happening there. We have condemned the bombing uh, that happened in the past months, and all acts of violence, and we have been trying to bring an end to that. So we will be continuing to do our best uh, to find a, a solution. This is the most I can say about, uh, about this as, as, a, um, uh, as a reaction to, to, to your question. We will be working with the, the uh, international community, with members of the Security Council, with the um, Arab League members, with everyone who uh, we are talking to, to everyone, even uh, to, to the uh, Russians, to, to the uh, Chinese, and, and, and we have seen that visits are taking place in Syria, and everyone is maybe trying to uh, help finding a solution, and I hope we will find one. My name is Lee. I'm from the BYU Daily University. It is honored to see Your Excellency. Um, I have two, two quick questions. Um, I had a privilege to talk with a female student from Morocco. Louder. I had a privilege to talk with a female student from Morocco, and she mentioned about what she said, the new constitution, and it was more of an evolution not revolution, which made a peaceful, um, she said, democratic reforms in a progressive line. Um, I understand Morocco has a kingship, and uh, I was wondering, could you help me to understand how the kingship work with um, democratic reforms in progressive line? And I have a second question after that. Okay, I can answer many ways. Um, first, uh, you have many kingdoms in the world. And uh, in Europe, we can name many, you know, Spain, Denmark, Sweden, and so Holland, and so, and so, and so. Uh, uh, this idea that uh, democracy doesn't work with kingdoms, it's, it's something that is uh, a little strange. You can have a democratic situation. Uh, it depends. Democracy is giving more uh, to the people, involving everybody, having parties, having free elections, having uh, free press, uh, uh, having NGOs, having, 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 and so this is democracy. And, and uh, uh, the king has been doing this, and his father has been doing this, and building this democracy and this evolution to this constitutional uh, monarchy. On the other side, countries that to qualify as democratic just because they are republics, you see that uh, many of them have been putting the one, his son, one trying to put another member of the family to succeed him. This is what was happening in, in Egypt. Uh, this is what was happening in Libya. This is what uh, uh, maybe was happening in uh, uh, Tunisia. This is what uh, was uh, what happened in Syria and so on. So you had this succession of uh, a president bringing his son after being uh, 
changing the constitution and being reelected and reelected and then after 30 or 20 or 35 years in power then having his son succeeding to, to him. Uh, it's not because you have republic that it's g guarantee for a uh, uh, democratic life. You see. But what we have been doing in, in Morocco and uh, uh, it's true that it was an evolution. I mean, we you have to build democracy. I mean, you know, I was I was looking at at some figures last time. I don't know when I put that. Yeah, just in uh, many democracies, if you when when women have been allowed to vote, I mean that is important. It's part of the population, half of the population in every country. Each country half the population are women. Uh, they were allowed to vote in Morocco in 1963. But in Switzerland, 1971, you would have said, oh, Switzerland is the biggest. It doesn't mean that it was not a democracy, but what happened there, it was only that 1971 that women were allowed to, to vote. In Portugal, 1976, uh, all women were allowed to vote before that only those who had diploma were allowed to vote. If, you, if you're not graduated uh, from a university, you couldn't vote. Uh, in South Africa, 1994, that uh, black women have been allowed to vote. So it's a process that takes time and, and reforms are becoming one after the other, uh, the other and it improves the democratic life and the, this is the way even in this country you have been building your democracy since your uh, independence in 1776 and even if you compare one state to another you will find big differences and you will not say oh this one is less democratic than the other but you have different rules that have been decided by the uh, population of a state because they think that this is what the best for them and they are doing it but no one from another state will say uh, this is not good or you are not democratic and things are moving and sometimes uh, 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 new uh, reforms are implemented even in countries that are big democracies so it's a process that takes time and you just have to see the trend. You cannot just just one minute in one second. Salam alaikum, ya Sharif. Labas alik. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I'm uh, Jay Lenford. I have a, a Near Eastern Studies degree here from BYU. But my question is, um, what suggestions do you have for small US companies that would like to do business in Morocco to establish better relations? Contact me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, uh, we we have been talking of of this uh, here in in Utah because many companies are coming to to Morocco and we are uh, will be receiving uh, I think next month a delegation of businessmen. First, you need the framework, and the framework is there. We have a free trade agreement. It means that uh, products from uh, the United States uh, can enter freely into Morocco and vice versa. We have also a free trade agreement with the European Union, which is a very, very big market. And by this combination of uh, uh, business between Moroccan and uh, American companies, or just American companies coming to Morocco, working Morocco as a gateway to Europe, which is 10 miles from Morocco, it takes half an hour to cross the channel and to be in Spain. Uh, I think it's a big opportunity uh, that we have been uh, creating. So we have the framework, we are improving the, the framework to avoid non-double taxation. So if you pay taxes here, you will not be pay, paying them in Morocco and, and so on. And with the US Chamber of Commerce, with the uh, Moroccan institutions with the embassy uh, with people like our honorary consul and all those who know morocco and would like to develop commerce with morocco we will be able to help you when we, you 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 heard about my background i am more economic economist than, than a diplomat or or so i 
have been doing this a long time and uh, I really can help. I will be leading a delegation from the US Chamber of Commerce uh, next month to, uh, to Morocco. We will be participating in many events here, just explaining what is Morocco, how safe it is to make business there, and uh, we are happy when you make money in, in Morocco. So uh, this friendship means also that we can do business, and uh, if you need any help, just contact me. Monsieur Bessado, je m'appelle Serge, je suis professeur de l'histoire au Brésil. Euh, après toutes les manifestations politiques sur le monde arabe, qu'est-ce qu'il y a futur pour la souveraineté dans les États Je m'excuse, je n'ai pas vraiment compris. Le, quels États uh, I don't know this word oh. in English. Uh, souveraineté. Um, Sovereignty, yes, yes, yeah. no, I Après understand. Après toute la manifestation politique. Ah, you mean in this, dans, dans tous oui. ces États, euh, les pays arabes, est-ce que la souveraineté est en danger à cause de ces révolutions? Oui. Oh. So, shall I continue in French? Or, or <laughs> because he asked me the question in French, and then he even corrected it in French, so I don't know if I have to answer you in French, but no, what, what's happening is just a change sometimes of regime more liberty giving to people. It, has, it does, has nothing to do with the sovereignty of states. No one has been invaded. No one has lost his sovereignty. Uh, the regime has changed. M new powers have come. Uh, new parties have come. And then you have to work with, with this. I mean, in Tunisia, for instance, you have, uh, I don't know, 36 or something like that, 35 parties now. Uh, yes, so they are all involved in the in the public life but the sovereignty of tunisia no one is is, is it's not in question no what is in, it's how they are building the new democracy and uh, uh, th this is a good friend of morocco and uh, our foreign minister went to tunisia the president was in an official visit few uh, days ago so we are helping each other and each one of us is benefiting from the expertise of the other the experience of the other but when we talk of the Arab Spring or the uh, uprisings, and no one has been talking of a country that has lost its sovereignty or uh, no. Hello, my name is Kara Anderson and I'm a student in public health here. And my question is, well, more of a request. I would like to know a bit of your view on the U.S.'s role in affairs of the Middle East and maybe what you think that should be versus what it is. Oh, you, you, you mean should the Americans do things differently? Is this the question? Yes, exactly. What are they ah. doing and what do you think about it and what could be better? Uh, this, is, this is a question first you have to ask to the Americans. I mean, I cannot... <laughs> Judge, I don't know exactly what they are doing. I, I am not. They, they uh, I'm not in in their secrets of these everyday decisions. So, uh, but but uh, I think they are doing well in most of the cases, and and uh, uh, they are dealing with the international community. They are dealing with allies. They are dealing with friends, and sometimes uh, decisions are not uh, easy. And uh, very few decisions are taken by one. One state, you have to consult many, many others, and you have to take care of the opinions of many uh, others, and this is this is very uh, difficult sometimes. So, I cannot judge what the Americans are are doing. It's not my role, and if I do it, I will be overlapping on my responsibilities here, and they might not be very happy with that. But, but uh, as I told you, we have been allies. We have been for so many years and we are working very closely on all those cases like you uh, mentioned uh, uh, Syria in the Security Council, the United States are a non -per uh, are a permanent member so now we are non-permanent member we are working very closely uh, to be able to um, take decisions or to uh, help in difficult situations and, and uh, it's not only one country that decides by, by itself. Maybe the, the last one. Okay. Um, 
My name is Rige Sophie. I'm, I'm majoring in Middle Eastern Studies and Arabic here. Um, you mentioned at the beginning some uh, pressures that many Arab states had in common um, prior to the revolution, such as um, high, high populations under 30, as well, um, especially high youth unemployment. And I was curious to know um, what kinds of things Morocco has done to address the, um, those kind of issues. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, the situation is not easy. First, there is a big crisis in Europe, and uh, Morocco is doing 75% of this of his trade with with Europe. So if the crisis uh, is is big in Europe, then it it uh, hurts us a lot because uh, we cannot export and our industries are in difficulty. And when an industry is in difficulty, then you have unemployment. Our Gross rate have been around 5% last, last year. We are doing all our best to improve that. Uh, unemployment is around 11%, but it's 16% uh, in the young graduates. And, and this is uh, uh, some a big concern for, the, uh, for Morocco. And, and this new government is doing his best to see how we could improve things and attract uh, uh, foreign investment and, and develop uh, domestic uh, uh, investment. Tourism has been doing well in Morocco uh, despite what we call the Arab Spring. There was not a big decrease in, in tourism. And, and tourism is important because uh, we receive more than 10 million visitors uh, in, in Morocco, and this is very important because it's a lot of, um, of employment. Agriculture is still doing very well, and you know how important agriculture is in Morocco. We have been developing new sectors, right, like renewable energy. We are really having a great, great program of $9 billion investment in renewable energy, and our target in 2020 is to produce 38% of our electricity from renewables. So all this creates opportunities, but it doesn't mean that uh, we have solved the problems. There are many uh, ahead. One of them is also the uh, correlation, you know, here, when people are graduated, they also have been uh, following uh, trainings. Industry and university in uh, uh, the United States are working very closely together. So when people are graduated, they are almost ready to find a job because they are exactly what uh, business and, and uh, um, companies are asking for. This is not the case in Morocco. We have a little bit difficulties. When people are graduated and they go, they have not a lot of experience, and we are working on, on training people. I don't know if you heard about this big project in the north of Morocco. Uh, it has been started by um, Renault-Nissan, and it's a big company that uh, will start to produce cars. It has, it has started, and they will be producing 400,000 cars for the European market. And uh, for this special investment, that is a huge investment in the north of Morocco, uh, we have been training people. When the investment has started and when the company has started to produce, it has been three years. And during the three years, we have been training people. So when the company started, they were ready to uh, start producing cars. So there is a big, big program of training of people and to help them find uh, jobs and to have the uh, skills for the job that are, are needed. But uh, you are right, it's, it's a very serious problem, but not uh, only in Morocco, it's, it's everywhere. And everyone is, is fighting, and I, I was present when the president made his uh, um, speech at the, 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 to the nation and the address to the nation, and uh, most of the speech was about uh, employment and how uh, fight and our help companies and then he mentioned China and so and so how we will be doing in the United States to uh, have jobs for Americans in the United States, but it's the challenge for for everybody So thank you very very much for your attention and uh, You are You are you are students in uh, political science and international relations, I can tell you that I 
you, you heard my, my resume, I have been working in many uh, sectors, in many ministries, and uh, it is the most interesting job I had in my life, and if I had to encourage you to go to diplomacy, uh, people think that we are just in receptions drinking champagne, this is just the part you see, and it's really not our job. We, we can do a lot, and it's a job in which you deal with everything. I am here in the university giving a lecture. I will be tomorrow uh, at the chamber. I will be talking about uh, humanitarian activities. I was in culture. I talk of agriculture. We talk about politics and international relations. It's really challenging and it's a nice job. So those of you who think maybe they would go to diplomacy, I would encourage you to. And my embassy is open. If you happen to come to uh, DC, please visit me. This is not a diplomatic sentence. This is a reality. Uh, try me. Come to DC and come visit me. I will be happy to receive you and to talk to you about uh, any issue you would like to raise. And thank you very, very much for listening to me.